I think of death not as a smokestack, but as an opening door. Mapping the Bones is not the typical World War II story that depicts life in secret hiding rooms or death camps. Instead, it follows the Hansel and Gretel form, the time spent at home when everyone is starving, the time spent wandering in the woods, and the time at the evil witch's house, unsure of what is safe and what isn't. In a split perspective book, readers fall Haim and Gittel, Jewish twins who are brother and sister, trying to survive a labor camp where everyone has a price. For readers who enjoyed Between Shades of Grey or Number the Stars, Mapping the Bones provides another unique historical fiction perspective of the lives of Jewish children during World War II. In 1942, Haim and Gittel live in the ghetto in Lotz, Poland, with their mother and father. Haim, who stutters, only says about 15 words a day. But that's okay, because he and his twin Gittel have a secret twin sign language. Nobody, not even their parents, have figured out how they communicate. Jews are shot in the streets, go missing, or are deported to Nazi camps regularly. In order to earn enough money to live, Papa rents living space to a Jewish dentist and his family. When the dentist goes missing, the rest are put on the wedding invitation list, code for being the next group to be handed over to the Nazis by the Jewish council. On his way to sell Mama's wedding ring to pay for an escape, Haim sees a five-year-old girl dead in the street and begins to feel real fear. But who would shoot a little girl? He bit his lip. Who would beat her? It made no sense. And suddenly, for the first time since they moved into the ghetto, a real, deep-rooted fear invaded him. Maybe because he was alone on the street, even in the midst of a crowd. Maybe because the girl was so young. Maybe because she could be mistaken for rags, trod upon, kicked to the gutter because no one had claimed her. Maybe all of those things. Nothing about their escape goes smoothly. The meeting place is burned to the ground and being searched by nasties, what the qu twins call Nazis. The only way to ensure survival is for the twins and the dentist's two children to separate from Mama and Papa. Papa promises that they will follow in a week at most. Months later, they are still wandering the woods with a resistant group that helps Jews escape and raids Nazi search parties when they're captured and sent to Sobonek, a concentration work camp for children. There, the children learn a new sign, a single finger pointed in the air, spiraling up. It is the silent sign that the prisoners use in reference to the chimney where the dead are burned. The twins fall into the rhythm of life, making ammunition for the Nazis, careful not to anger any of their overseers, but aware that every bullet they make is another dead Jew. Heim begins to question what a normal life really is. Could it be that humans had an infinite capacity to make themselves at home in the direst of situations? Or did one just adjust expectations downward so as to be able to get through each day? When typhoid hits the camp, Dr. Von Schneer is sent in to make sure that the child laborers are healthy enough to keep production from failing. Having separated from his work as Dr. Mangle's assistant, it doesn't take long before he becomes interested in the twins. Will the twins survive the camp? And if they do, what condition will they be in? Will they be reunited with Mama and Papa? Find out in Mapping the Bones by Jane Yolen.